Good afternoon. I'm here to brief the results of the investigation I directed following the report of civilian casualties from our strike in Kabul on 29 August. Having thoroughly reviewed the findings of the investigation and the supporting analysis by interagency partners, I am now convinced that as many as 10 civilians, including up to seven children, were tragically killed in that strike. Moreover, we now assess that it is unlikely that the vehicle and those who died were associated with ISIS-K or were a direct threat to US forces. I offer my profound condolences to the family and friends of those who were killed. This strike was taken in the earnest belief that it would prevent an imminent threat to our forces and the evacuees at the airport, but it was a mistake. And I offer my sincere apology. As the combatant commander, I am fully responsible for this strike and its tragic outcome. While I've begun with the most important findings of our investigation, I do want to provide the background leading up to the strike and include an explanation as to why we felt reasonably certain that this was a legitimate strike on an imminent ISIS-K threat with no indication that the strike would result in civilian casualties as we asserted in our initial statements. The strike on 29 August must be considered in the context of the situation on the ground in Kabul at Hamid Karzai International Airport following the ISIS-K attack that resulted in the deaths of 13 soldiers, sailors, and Marines, and more than 100 civilians at Abbey Gate on 26 August, and also with a substantial body of intelligence indicating the imminence of another attack. In the 48 hours prior to the strike, sensitive intelligence indicated that the compound at point number one on the map, and let's bring the map up now, please. And we're just gonna bring this up. Hopefully you have an opportunity to, to see it here as we go forward. John, can you see the map there? Tape disabled as well. Hey, John, can you, uh, can you hear me now? The press have hard copies. Okay, Roger. Then I'm just going to I'm going to continue based on that. Then, uh, John, in the 48 hours prior to the strike, sensitive intelligence indicated that the compound at point number one on the map was being used by ISIS-K planners, used to facilitate future attacks. We were also receiving a significant number of reports indicating multiple avenues of attack, which were being planned simultaneously, to which ISIS-K would attempt to harm our forces including with rockets, suicide explosive vests, and vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices. In fact, in the 36 hours preceding the strike, our leaders on the ground at the airport and in the strike cell received more than 60 different pieces of intelligence related to imminent threats, with some intelligence corroborating and some conflicting, with events observed from our UAVs, which were flying above Kabul throughout the day. One of the most recurring aspects of the intelligence was that ISIS-K would utilize a white Toyota Corolla as a key element in the next attack. Because the compound at point number one was our strongest lead for this series of imminent attacks, we initiated an intense surveillance of the compound with as many as six MQ-9 Reapers on the morning of 29 August. At 8.52 a.m. local time on 29 August, a white Toyota Corolla arrived at point number one, the compound we believed to be a key area of interest associated with imminent threats to the airport. Two adult males exited the vehicle, met with an adult male in the compound, and received a bag from him. The Corolla then departed the compound heading south, and we followed the vehicle. At 9.05 a.m., the Toyota Corolla picked up a third adult male carrying a bag at point number two, and then continued south. At 9.35, the Corolla arrived at the compound at point number three, which we now know to include an Office of Nutrition and Education International, and all three adult males in the vehicle entered the building on the compound. At 11.19 a.m., three adult males unloaded bags and jugs from the trunk of the vehicle before departing the compound at 11.22 a.m. heading south. At approximately this time, U.S. forces were notified of a sensitive intelligence collection indicating that an ISIS-K cell leader in Kabul was dropping off supplies. At 12.11 p.m., 
the Corolla arrived at point number four, and at least two adult male occupants exited the vehicle in front of an office building before returning to their vehicle and departing at 1.27 p.m., heading west and then south. At 2 o'clock p.m., the Corolla returned to the compound at point number three. Subsequently, multiple adult males were observed loading the truck of the vehicle, the trunk of the vehicle, with items assessed at the time to be explosives. Before departing at 3.47 p.m. with four adult males heading north. At 4.11 p.m., the Corolla returned to point number two and dropped off one adult male carrying a bag, then continued north. After driving near point number one, the Corolla dropped off one adult male on the road at point number five, which is roughly several hundred meters north of point number one. At 4.39 p.m., the Corolla dropped off its last passenger on the road at point number six. At 4.51 p.m., the Corolla arrived at point number seven and backed into a compound that was approximately three kilometers from the airport which was the closest it came to the airport all day. We were very concerned that the vehicle could move quickly and beat the airport boundary in a matter of moments. By this time, we had observed the vehicle for about eight hours. While in the compound, the vehicle was observed being approached by a single adult male assessed at the time to be a co-conspirator. The strike was executed at this time because the vehicle was stationary and to reduce the potential for civilian casualties. The single Hellfire, Hellfire missile was fused to detonate inside the vehicle to further minimize the chance for civilian casualties. It struck the vehicle at, vehicle at 4.53 p.m., which produced an explosive event and follow-on flames significantly larger than a Hellfire missile would have been expected to produce. It is my assessment that leaders on the ground and the strike cell had achieved a reasonable certainty at the time of the strike to designate the vehicle as an imminent threat to U.S. forces at the airport, and that they made this self-defense strike in accordance with established rules of engagement. That assessment is based upon interviews with leaders on the ground and members of the strike cell, on a review of the intelligence available to the team at the time of the strike, and on the team's interpretation of how this vehicle and its occupants' actions were confirming the intelligence that they were seeing. It is further my assessment that the strike team were convinced at the time of the strike that the area was clear of civilians and that they had taken prudent steps in regards to weaponeering the strike to minimize the potential for civilian casualties. Finally, it is my assessment that they did believe, as reported, that there was a secondary explosion. Our investigation now concludes that the strike was a tragic mistake. First, I will stress this was not a rushed strike. The strike cell deliberately followed and observed this vehicle and its occupants for eight hours while cross-checking what they were seeing with all available intelligence to develop a reasonable certainty of the imminent threat that this vehicle posed to our forces. Second, while the initial reports indicated a secondary explosion, the initial investigation could only conclude that there was a possible to probable presence of external accelerants that could include either explosive material in the vehicle or an ignition of the gas tank of the vehicle. Subsequent analysis could not rule out the presence of a small amount of explosive material, but determined that the most likely cause was the ignition of gas from a propane tank located immediately behind the car. Such an ignition would have created the brief but massive fireball oriented directly up and out of the compound that was observed in the video and displayed in this photo. If we could get that next photo up, please. They have them disabled, sir. Finally, while the strike cell reported, John, can you hear me okay? I got you, sir. Roger. Finally, while the strike cell reported the presence of two adult males, one inside the vehicle and one outside the vehicle at the time of the strike, the cell initiated a review of their footage immediately following the report of civilian casualties and determined that a few, a few partially obscured forms were briefly visible moving in the compound. This led to my initiation of an investigation within 24 hours of the strike. A comprehensive review of all the available footage and reporting 
on the matter led us to a final conclusion that as many as 10 civilians were killed in the strike, including up to seven children. At the time of the strike, based upon all the intelligence and what was being reported, I was confident that, that the strike had averted an imminent threat to our forces at the airport. Based upon that assessment, I and other leaders in the department repeatedly asserted the validity of this strike. I am here today to set the record straight and acknowledge our mistakes. I will end my remarks with the same note of sincere and profound condolences to the family and friends of those who died in this tragic strike. We are exploring the possibility of ex gratia payments. And I'll finish by saying that while the team conducted the strike, did so in the honest belief that they were preventing an imminent attack on our forces and civilian evacuees, we now understand that to be incorrect. With that, I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you, General. Um, 